Uh, the, the Leaning Tower of Pisa is one of the seven wonders of the world. Um, it is a monument to the beauty of imperfection. It is a cultural icon and it symbolizes the human ability to almost defy nature. Um, in the 12th century, the wealthy maritime Republic of Pisa, Italy, uh, they began a project to turn their cathedral square into a magnificent landmark. And as part of that project, they built a bell tower as a means to call the faithful to worship. Their engineers and architects were masters of their craft, but for all their knowledge, they, uh, they knew far less about the ground they were building on. Uh, the, the name Pisa uh, literally comes from an ancient Greek word that means marshy land, which perfectly describes the clay, the mud, and the wet sand that lie beneath the city's surface. The tower's architects misjudged how far down to build the foundation and they opted to only go three meters deep, which is less than 10 feet. And it was on really bad foundation. And so unfortunately for them, it took less than five years for the southern side of the structure to be completely underground, which would have uh, led to a quick collapse had they continued to build as they uh, intended to. Um, Further construction would have collapsed the tower, but they stopped building at the fourth story for the next century because Pisa descended into prolonged warfare. And so during the 100 years of no construction, the long pause allowed the soil to settle, and upon resuming construction, the foundation was on slightly more stable footing. And so here's a building that was built on bad foundation through conventional wisdom which led to the architectural plunder of a structure that looks like it's about to fall over. But through adversity that the city would have never brought upon itself, the ceasing of construction and the settling of the foundation created a, the marvel that it is today. There have been many attempts to improve the lean, most notably in the last 50 years, uh, they figured out the calculus that, uh, that they, they've been able to determine this, the tower's center of gravity and how stiff the soil is and how much of a lean will allow it to remain the attraction that it is without falling over. So the leaning tower of Pisa is not standing because of the hundreds of thousands of people who have taken pictures of themselves holding it up, okay? <laughs> um, it, it stands because its center of gravity is carefully kept within its base. We, we now know how much of a lean is too much and even with bad foundation, the center of gravity is key. Now listen to me on this. The structure was built on bad foundation, nevertheless, by miracle, it stands. Okay. Which is to say this, and I'm gonna take it further. Let's apply this now, class. <laughs> as far as our eternal destiny, we know Jesus Christ is the rock. He is meant to be our salvation. Uh, he is our cornerstone. On Christ, the solid rock we stand. All other ground is sinking sand. We know that song. Uh, but how many of you know that with many decisions we make on a daily, the weekly, monthly, even yearly basis, we are not always doing so with the posture of trusting the Lord with all of our heart, are we? Too often, we're using conventional wisdom in our decision-making process, and we build on compromised foundation, marshy land. I, I would submit to you that in Jesus, you and I are meant to be a sign that makes the world wonder. We, we are monuments to the beauty of imperfection, that, that we are to symbolize the human ability to almost defy nature. Right? God wants to use our lives as a means to call the faithful to worship, and whether it's unhealed trauma, or, or if it's uh, deception, or just a plain old lack of godly wisdom that has led you to build on compromised foundation, if you will keep Jesus at the center of your life, hear me, that, that, that if Jesus is your center of gravity and he's kept carefully within the base of who you are, your lean will be a marvel to the world. Uh, we, are, we are in the second week of a, of a four-week series that we're calling Rebellious Fidelity. And again, Rebellious Fidelity is a fierce and unwavering commitment to a cause or belief even in the midst of, of, uh, of opposition. Something or someone sits on the throne of every heart. We will all give ultimate allegiance and authority to something in our lives. 
right? I, I would submit to you um, that, that God must be that thing and everything else, as I said last week, is just a Flint River, yeah. right? It's sinking sand, marshy land, bad foundation, Pisa. In this series, we're breaking down one of the more famous passages in the Old Testament, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. And last week, we looked at the first part of that passage, trust in the Lord with all your heart. This week, we're going to look at the second part of that passage, lean not on your own understanding. Uh, but before we do, we're, we're, we're going to start by hearing a testimony from my friend, Ryan Olson. Uh, He's going to tell you about his journey of not leaning on his own understanding in the midst of disabilities and physical challenges. So will you stand with me and welcome yeah. Ryan as he comes up? Wow. That was 20 pounds ago. public speaking. All right. I was hoping I wouldn't be able to see any of you, but I can actually see all of you. Uh, forgive me if my hands droop, my arms are not very strong, so I might have to lean and chat. Um, as I look back at my life, I see Matthew 13 all over me, the, the parable of the sower and that first road where the birds ate all the seed. Uh, that was me back in high school. Before I could drive, uh, my stepmom, Renee, hi, Cheryl, watching, uh, she worked at a church that was like walking distance from my school. And so uh, after school, I would walk there and, and hang out and you know see the nice people. And I really, I'm like, oh, hey, church is, church is cool. There's nice people. Uh, and so I started going. And not for God, just for the girls. And, and I look back on that now and I can see that God had started reaching his hand into my life because, you know, he knew the path that was coming for me, uh, but I, I, didn't, I didn't understand my path yet, especially not at the beginning of high school. Bless you. Uh, so, 97 Bravo. Um, that was my first plan for my life. And in high school, I did really well on the ASVAB test, which I don't know, military here. Um, the ASVAB test is, you know, a, a academic test that you take and it, it, it tells the recruiters what kind of job to offer you. And so 97 Bravo, the army recruiters offered me that, which was counterintelligence. And I was like, bro, <laughs> my mind was set. I'm gonna be James Bond. So my understanding for how the rest of my life was going to go was set back in high school. I was 17 years old. Um, part of enlisting is a big physical at MEPS, the Military Enlistment Processing Station, I think. Um, and I knew I was always skinny and, and pretty weak, but the recruiters were like, dude, by the time you're out of basic, you'll be strong. Don't even worry about it. Um, and this is a physical where they pick you up at like 5 a.m. and you drive, and, and it's just a long, horrible day. And, and I failed the physical, um, and they, they let you know when you fail it, because it's a literal big red stamp on me that said PMR, thunk, which stands for Permanent Medical Rejection. Um, and all because I couldn't raise my arms over my head. And I'm like, dude, I'm not going to surrender. But <laughs> he, they, the doctor, Dr. Cook, he had none of that. Um, he sent, he sent me home, I was flabbergasted, adrift, I cried, the recruiter drove me home, dropped me off, never to be heard from again. Um, and I had, I had no other plans after high school. I never really considered college because I was gonna be a spy. Um, and so I, I kind of fell into you know, r random blue collar jobs and um, just 
whatever I could, whatever I could do. I wound up in automotive. Uh, my dad was a mechanic, grandpa before him, and so my dad. Um, uh, and, and that was fun, you know, light cars. So, okay, this is my new career. Uh, gonna, gonna be in automotive. But I'm still very weak and skinny, and I had no idea what was going on with me yet at this point. You know, it's early, early 20s. Uh, after several years of, um, at several years working in automotive, I, I got tired of like tripping over my foot and just being weak and dropping things. And so I did some research online. I was like, oh, I have this damaged nerve, so I'll just go in and get that fixed. And um, I thought that I understood what was wrong with me. And then the doctor was like, no, dude, you got muscular dystrophy. Um, and I was 24 at the time. I was advised to quit my job because it was all physical and that just causes your muscles to deteriorate faster because muscular dystrophy is a wasting disease, uh, which is why daily activity kind of makes it weaker and why I can't even curl my arm anymore. Uh, so that sucked. So at this point, I'm on permanent disability, um, really growing in depression. Luckily, I didn't have anxiety yet, so uh, just depressed. Um, yo, is that me? Is that me, Sean? Uh, <laughs> I uh, I was taking classes at a local community college, just trying to find something to do, and I uh, I had a panic attack. Um, first one, just no idea why. Thought I was dying. Um, if you ever had a panic attack, you legit think you're dying. Uh, drove home and just kind of sat in the room crying and, and fearful. Um, and I was renting a, renting a room at a house with some, with some friends and they were gone snowboarding, so I was by myself. And just unexpected, une unexpectedly, uh, one of their girlfriends showed up because uh, she was waiting for them to get back from snowboarding. And she just, she prayed over me. Um, no, I don't know that anyone ever really done that before. And I was calm, calmed after that. And the next day I was, you know, scared to be alone. And so I uh, texted them and I'm like, what's going on? Can I hang out with you? And she's like, we're going to church, come along. Um, and so I did. And the word of God started landing on me there. But that soil was rocky. Uh, I was super depressed. Now I had anxiety as well. And um, I think it was there... At that church, someone suggested I start volunteering, um, you know, to, to fill time and, and, and find something good for my heart. Apologies if the mic keeps going in and out. Um, I wound up volunteering at a, a life skills program for adults with developmental disabilities, uh, like an hour a week, and I just I fell in love with it. Uh, I didn't know I had a heart for serving, but I wound up serving there full time. I would volunteer uh, eight hours a day, five days a week. Uh, it was a permanent disability at the time, so I didn't have much else to do. But it was just, it was great. Um, I didn't know, that, I, didn't, I didn't really know at that point, you know, the Holy Spirit's probably working in me. Um, eventually, that turned into a job. They created a new course and a position, so I got to work um, with, with a bunch of adults with Asperger's Syndrome, where I, I was a teacher's aide, uh, just, just helping out there. But... It was a brand new program, so I, we got to, as part of the course, learn how to make a website. Um, and I, I liked making the website, so I turned that into a, a, a job somehow. Because at the same church I was going to, it's fascinating to look back and see God's spider web of things working out. Um, there was a, a guy there who, uh, who worked at a place where the CTO of a startup company was looking for a web developer. And I told him, like, I, I, won't, I don't want to be on disability anymore. I, I like websites. I'd love to try and, try and go. And he gave me, he gave me a chance. Um, later, I found out he was a believer. So it was, it was cool to see you know, God working those threads, which I don't think I even figured out until many, many years later. Shortly after that, landing that job, uh, I kind of needed a place to live because the house, the room I was renting, that guy got married and um, met some friends at church, Jim and Deanne. Hi, Deanne, if you're watching. And uh, they needed a place to live the same time I did, so we rented a house together. And so now I'm like, man, I got a church, got a house, got a job, my path's looking great. Uh, about a year into that, they had their first child, Jace. Hi, Jace. Um, <laughs> I... Uh, I got to hold him at two hours old, um, so the youngest life I held, and, and, and Jace, Jace flipped something in my heart about life and the preciousness of it. Um, 
Yeah, it really, yeah, that was, that was special. Uh, about two and a half later, Tristan was born. Hi, Tristan. Um, and my heart grew even more. And I worked, because I worked from home, so I got to watch them grow every moment. And I, uh, I was Uncle Ryan, or Kai, they called me Kai. Um, it, was, it was a very special time to have, to have that family. I stopped going to church after that, because yeah, shortly, shortly after you know, they were born, we kind of, that church kind of um, diverged, and, and, and we just stopped going. Um, I do believe I came to a saving faith uh, at, at that church we were going to, but there the, the thorns of life choked out the deep roots, and I really fell away from God. Mostly I was just bitter and envious of everyone having everything I never thought I could ever have, um, never have my own family or a, or a house or a wife or any of these things, just depression and anxiety, fears of the future. All of my eggs of hope and worth um, were in the basket of my job and the, those two boys. Uh, I remember one night just we were watching a movie and panic set in. I was like, things are too good to be true. Something is, this is going to fail. And uh, the next day I remember panicking more and I jumped in my truck and just took off. And I, I texted a friend from that church from a few years ago. Uh, and I was just like, dude, I, I help. I don't know what to do. I'm driving to this church um, that I happen to know was, was up the right. Can you meet me there? And he met me there, sat with me. I cried. He prayed. Um, but that moment was God throwing a lasso around me saying, dude, I've been trying to get you, so grab onto me because, you know, you, you're going to need to hang on tight. Things are going to happen. Uh, I, my biggest fear was losing my job and losing the family, and uh, not, not shortly after that, I, I, I needed God. Because when Jace was about seven, I found out again how little I actually understood the path I was on. The company I was working for uh, was acquired, and I was laid off. Um, Deanne's mother, Anne, hi Anne, had a, uh, a TBI, a traumatic brain injury, and she needed, you know, full-time support. Uh, as her husband had recently passed, the, Deanne and the boys, and they had to move in to take care of her mom. Uh, but there was no place for me. And so I'm unemployed and alone, and, and uh, thank God I was able to move in with my dad because I had no money, and thanks, Dad. Hi. <laughs> So I know I'm not a parent, but I, I swear, I was as close as you could be without actually having a child of myself, and it felt like I lost part of my heart. I cried myself to sleep nightly out of heartbreak and anger uh, at God for quite some time. But eventually I started leaning in more, um, somehow, don't know how, Holy Spirit. I remember one night in a dream, of which I rarely dream, I heard in my head just clear as day, Psalm 42:11. And I don't know why I hadn't been reading Psalms or, or anything, but I woke up and uh, it was still right in my head. And even rarely do I remember my dreams, but I woke up, Psalm 4211. So I looked it up, of course. Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. Dude. Felt like something I needed or was supposed to hear. Perhaps God was reaching out. I think I posted on Facebook at the time and people were like, that's a Rima word. And I didn't know what that meant. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's correct or if it's true or if it's what. I'm, uh, but if God was speaking to me, I should listen. So maybe there's hope in my journey. I kept pursuing a new job and I was blessed with an opportunity. It's a great company. It's been closing on six years now. My, much better than what I, where I was at before. Uh, I met and married Mary Beth, my beautiful. I love you. <laughs> uh, my beautiful best friend who helps me remember to put God first always. I was grafted into a pretty good community. <laughs> Carrie. And to top off the sheer insanity of all this that's going on, we somehow managed to buy a house. Come, come on now. So, a married house, community, wow. This, this is the path. This is where I'm, where I'm understanding my smooth sailing starts. Now I'm just coasting in my walk with God. I just think I became complacent and very academic, um, not really pursuing a relationship, just head knowledge. 
Several months ago, the Holy Spirit punched me in the gut out of the blue, reminding me of sins from 25 years ago. Stupid, stupid mistakes of a depressed, lost soul that wanted all the wrong things and, and searched for all the wrong things. Uh, I was destroyed. Uh, just conviction, shame, fear, paranoia. I suddenly hadn't had the understanding of what sin was, what sin cost, what Jesus paid for. I deserve death and condemnation. The wages of my sin should certainly be death. But praise be to God. For I understand now, finally, I am learning more and more in my relationship the meaning of 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, the new things have come. I am a new creation in Christ, worthy of nothing, but because of his mercy and abounding grace, I get to tell my story. And hopefully, Lord willing, help some people that he puts in my path. Amen. Amen. technology. Um, I want to pray for you. All right. Um, Aaron, will you come up? Bob, Brandon. Lord, I just thank you for my friend. God, I thank you for his life. Um, just hearing your story, I'm reminded of Psalm 94, where it talks about, you know, when anxiety was great in me, God, your great consolation brought me joy. God, thank you that you are not a God that makes mistakes. I know that Ryan has spent a lot of time asking why am I like this and why did this happen the way it did and this or that, but I thank you, God, that you just have this beautiful way. You have this beautiful way of working your purposes out. And we don't always get the answers but as we walk with you, as we trust you, God, all things are made clear. So I just pray a blessing on my brother. Or I even pray uh, for his body. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we do not accept that this is just how it is. God, this is a church that believes in healing, yeah? Yes. So Lord Jesus, would you just stretch forth your hand through your holy child? Would you flood his body? the healing virtue of Jesus just flow in him right now. Thank you, Lord God, that your name is higher. Your name is greater than any disease. You are the great physician. God, thank you that you're touching his body right now, that the peace of God is flooding him right now. The healing virtue is flowing right now in his body. In Jesus' name. Yeah. Thank you, Lord, for it is you who are at work in Ryan's body, heart, mind, and soul, to do your good pleasure. And you have been at work. Even when he didn't realize it, you are at work. And you will be at work tomorrow in his life. We say thanks for all the blessings that you've given him, God, his wife, his family, his community, the ability to come and face fear this morning and just uh, crush it. <clears throat> I thank you, man. Thank you, God. This is a man who crushes it. And I thank you that he knows how to trust you and he's learning. And you are able to do above all that he could ever ask or think. And uh, that will be his mantra, that God did more than I ever could have imagined in my life and through my life. And I thank you, God, that you are giving him great favor in all realms as you continue to bless this man in Jesus' name. 
Um, Ryan, I just believe that something that the Lord wants to highlight for you is just um, that there is leadership on your life. Um, and that the, 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 the phrase that I kept hearing was um, leadership is just being somebody who's willing to tell people I've been there before. So, Father, I just thank you um, that in the middle of him um, sharing vulnerably from his story that you're actually breaking things off uh, that don't need to be there. God, that you're further conforming his mind um, around the goodness of God and having that become a starting point for where he starts thought processes, where his heart starts when he's looking at the future. Um, So we just thank you for what you're releasing in him and through his life, God. Ryan, I, I actually saw um, a picture of you and your wife, Mary Beth, walking on this path. And it was dim, and it was dark, and you guys couldn't see where you were going. But as you guys smiled, the whole path illuminated, and it lighted up. And it, you could see you could see everything down to the cellular level like you guys could see everything you knew exactly where you were going and i just heard the lord say your smiles will light the path so lord we just pray over his body over his wife's body that the joy of the lord would be their strength and we thank you for that gift that you have given them. There's a lot of times where you have said that you don't have these gifts or that gifts or you've had that that comparison. But the Lord has given every single one of us specific gifts and yours is joy. And when you and your wife smile, other people can't not smile around you guys. You just can't. It, It comes out of you just so beautifully. So Lord, we just bless that gift in them. Yes, and we thank you for the love that you have for them. Yeah. And, and as they choose to smile, Lord, you will strengthen them and you will strengthen the people around them in Jesus' name. Yeah. Amen. 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 Man, he just reminded me how many of my friends don't watch me online, so that's cool. <laughs> All right, so Proverbs uh, 3, 5 gives us a pair of complimentary commands. All right, and so we are told positively to trust in the Lord with all our heart and then negatively not to trust our own understanding, right? So these two statements are mutually exclusive. You can't do one without doing the other. The the, the way to do the one is to the neglect, I should say, of the other, right? And so the way to trust in the Lord with all your heart is by not leaning on your own understanding, okay? So just like the Tower of Pisa, God wants you to lean, but he wants you to lean his way, right? And so I just want to give you uh, three ways that we lean on our own understanding, and then I'll, I'll finish with God's plan to engineer a new way. Amen? Yeah. And so we lean uh, on our own understanding through pride, through our pride, through our performance, and through our plans. Yeah. All right. We lean on our own understanding through our pride, through our performance, and through our plans. All right, so first, our pride. Um, To lean on something means uh, to to have something else support you, right? But pride will have none of that. It'll have none of that. See, many of us would call ourselves Christians. We would say that we have given our lives to Jesus, but you don't allow Jesus to inform your decision-making process, right? In your pride, in your wisdom, you call your own shots. You march at the beat of your own drum. You pull yourself up by your bootstraps, and then you ask God to bless it. All right. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but it leads to death. And so it is the grace of God to recognize the pride in our hearts and to get to the point where we scrutinize our own decisions. 
It's the grace of God. That not only can you not trust yourself, and I made this point last week, that you can't trust yourself, but you also still have an old nature that wants to wrestle with God and please your, your flesh. There's this uh, worship song out that just kind of invaded my, my playlist, and I heard it a few times, and, um, and the words really caught me. It goes like this. I'm not going to sing, so don't worry. Why are you guys like that? <laughs> What's wrong with you guys? It goes like this. You, like you guys totally killed the vibe of this. All right, it goes. <laughs> It goes like this. You have led me through the fire, and I've made it safe this far. Oh, I sing you're my desire, but you know the hidden parts. You meet me in the hiding. You're the only one who sees the idols in my heart. You pursue me in the moment, even when my choices are tearing me apart. And here's the, the chorus. This is the part here. So why is there a war to give you all of me when you love me like you do, and I know you like I do? Listen to that. Why is there a war to give you all of me when you love me like you do and I know you like I do? Um, about seven years ago, I violated one of my own rules and got a dog for my family. <laughs> now, don't judge me. Hear me out here. I have nothing against dogs. Um, I just have no need for a furry shetty, messy creature living in my home that's hard to communicate with. I have enough of those in my home. Okay. See, you guys got me going, so it's you guys' fault. Amy, I love you. That, 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 was, that was the girls, not you, girl. I'm just dead to rights on that one. I don't know what to even say. I just, I don't like dogs. Can I, am, can I confess that in church? No, I like, I like, I like them. I don't need to have one. And I finally bent the knee and I, I got a dog. And listen, this dog was, it was part Maltese, part Yorkie. And so it was cute, but he was horrible. I mean, horrible. Right, he hated me always. No amount of time around him changed. Years later, I'd walk into a room and he still would freak out when I like I when I come home from work, I am an intruder to him in my own house. He listen, I can't I couldn't sing out loud he'd freak out, right? I couldn't move quickly, he'd freak out. If I would wrestle with my girls, he would absolutely go nuts thinking I'm trying to hurt them. I mean, I could do, anytime anyone would come, he would bark at them, so our house was super unwelcoming, like all these different things. And Amy, you know, years ago, she gave me kind of a, an out. She said, listen, this is not a normal dog experience. If you, need, if you need to get rid of him, I understand. And I was like, man, I was an abandoned kid. Like, I'm not kicking him out of my house. I'm not doing this. And so I, like, I, I tried forever. I tried really hard. And I'm not proud to say this. I'm not proud to say this, but we finally rehomed him. We, we finally pulled the trigger. We did it. Not rehomed him. So to pull the trigger meant we got rid of him. Okay, I wanna, I wanna be clear, I wanna be clear. Put the gun down, put the gun down, no. Okay, put the gun down. What I meant was we, we, gave him, we gave him up, that's what I meant. Listen, he just, he could not adjust to our home. He just couldn't, in his doggish pride, All right? He thought the home was his, and he never understood that everything he was given 
was given to him by the person he opposed the most. I would tell him, I buy your food, fool. <laughs> he would, I'm doing too much. But he would, he would hang around Amy's feet so much, she would kick him all the time on accident. And I'd say, I never abuse you. <laughs> anyway, all right, moving on. But listen, I, you know, I just, I imagine now, so he's been gone for about a week and a half, maybe two weeks. And listen, I, I'm a happier person, I gotta say. <laughs> but I just imagine he's at his new house, which is not heaven, he's at an actual house. <laughs> just saying to himself, man, why was there a war <laughs> to give him all of me? He loved me. I gotta move on. All right, so leaning on your own understanding through pride leaves no room for God because you're too busy focusing on you. All right, and so you are your own center of gravity. All right, so uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna move on. So pride blinds you to the reality uh, to the reality and keeps you focused on yourself. It is impossible to trust the Lord with all your heart when you trust yourself the most. Amen. And so we, we lean our own understanding through pride, secondly, through performance. All right. Now, one of the clearest pictures of this uh, is in Genesis 3, where we see the first sin of humanity. So Adam and Eve uh, were told explicitly, do not eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they do it anyway. Right. And the Bible says that immediately their eyes were opened uh, and they realized they were naked. And to fix this issue, what they did was they covered themselves with fig leaves, which is guilt. And when God came looking for them, they hid, which is shame. All right. And so one way to lean on your own understanding is to be so blinded by self-absorption, pride, um, that you can't see God. Another way is to become so aware of your flaws and shortcomings that you cover up and hide. And the moment you put a mask on, you're acting. It's a performance. Oh, yeah, right. It's a performance. Um, Amy and I, we've been reading a book by a pastor out of Southern California uh, named uh, Megan Fate Marshman. She hits this uh, issue of performance hard. She says, moralism is the common human solution to avoid dealing with the problem of sin and guilt before God. Moralism is not doing something bad. It's trying to do something good because there's a hidden deep belief that no one can handle my bad but me. All right. See, the moralist doesn't want anyone to see their failure. They would rather keep working on their failure on their own. All right. Many of us learned this, and it was reinforced at a young age. Right? It, 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 seemed as though, it seemed as though our parents loved us more when we were being good versus when we were being bad. Yeah? And when we were being bad, it was all bad. Right? And so some of us were lucky enough to walk to our rooms. Other of us limped to our rooms when we were bad right? And then you couldn't leave your room until what? Until you could be good again, right? That's, that's how it worked for many of us. And so we carry that into our relationship with God and think we need to perform. And so we come into this new life on Jesus's merits. Listen to this. We get this new life. The whole reason why we got it, it was a gift given to us by God. And then once we get here, we immediately begin to try to earn our place. All right. And so here's the danger of moralism. Here's the danger. Just as you can run from God by being very bad, you can also run from God by being very good. All right. The story of the prodigal son is about two lost sons. One was very bad. He ran away. One was very good. He stayed home. Both were lost. Right. Both were not after their father's heart. They were after his hand. They wanted his stuff. One took the father's stuff and ran. The other one leaned on his good behavior. And at least the son that ran off and took his father's stuff knew in his heart he was wrong, and he eventually came back and repented. But go ahead and read the story, Luke 15. Look it up. What you'll see is there's no sign that the son that behaved, the good son, there's no sign that he ever repented. This is the danger of moralism. All right, this is the danger. Moralism will have you thinking, if I behave, God can't ask anything of me. And, and he owes me. 
Isn't that how you used to play your parents? You knew if I could just be really, really good, my parents won't ask me to do anything outside of my normal stuff. Oh, and then if you had a, a sibling that was the bad kid, then you really played this up, right? We try to bring that into our relationship with God. And so the moral temptation for Christians is to use service, is to use ministry, obedience, spiritual formation, spiritual discipline, spiritual experience, being good to relieve the burden of spiritual failure or lack of love and the guilt and shame that result. And so we, we lean on our own understanding through pride. We lean on our own understanding through performance, lastly, through our plans. All right. So there's this, there's a story in 1 Samuel 15 where God tells King Saul to totally destroy the Amalekites. Um, he tells him to, to not spare anyone or anything. Uh, and Saul goes and he destroys almost everyone and almost everything. And so he comes back and he keeps the, the best of the spoils uh, and he also keeps the king alive and God confronts him through the prophet Samuel and he says this, this famous line, he says, to obey is better than sacrifice, right? Or in other words, listening to my voice is much more important than your religious acts or doing things you think would make me happy. Way too many of us are spending less time quieting ourselves to listen to God's voice, and we're spending too much time doing religious acts and things we think would make God happy, right? right. Those are your plans, right? Those are your plans. Um, I heard this definition of the will of God a long time ago, never forgotten it. The will of God is what you would do if you knew everything God knew. Let me say it again. The will of God is what you would do if you knew everything God knew new right and so here's the good part the good part is as a believer there is no barrier there is no barrier the only thing keeping you from god is the pride in your heart that would say i can do things on my own it's the only thing you got to go to him regularly go to him right and, and let me just i want to tell you ahead of time before you hit the inevitable wall of going to the lord but not getting a clear answer on a decision that needs to be made all right, so two things I thought about so I was preparing for this. You're going to go to God, and you're going to say, God, I need help on this. And then silence. Okay. I want to, I want to give you two tips on this. All right. First thing, you would be shocked by how many decisions you think you have to make right away that don't require the urgency you give it. I'll say it again. You would be shocked by how many decisions you think you have to make right away that don't require the urgency you give it. Um, I, I've learned that nothing is so important that I don't have time to pray about it. Anytime I am pressed to make a decision right after I'm given information and I'm not afforded the opportunity to see God on it, it's a no. Sean, take it or leave it, leave it. If it's God today, it's God tomorrow. You'd be shocked how much you actually can take a step back before you make a decision. Secondly, second thing I've learned is everything you face. And actually, I, I, I was reading a marriage book because, as you guys see, I get up here and say stuff. <laughs> so, I was reading a marriage book uh, in Ted Tripp. He said this, but I, I think it's helpful here too. He said everything you face as a believer is predicted by command, principle, proposition, or perspective in the Bible. Everything you face as a believer is predicted by command, principle, proposition, or perspective in the Bible. There's nothing new under the sun. I know we think our challenges are unique to us and no one in the world has ever had to make the decision we have to make in this moment. But there's nothing new under the sun. Right. There is some mystery in how God guides. Right. But the parameters for many decisions we make are very clearly laid out in Scripture. Right. And, and I'll I'll confess this as a pastor. I've already put my foot in my mouth when I keep going. I'll confess this to you guys um, in an effort to avoid being too harsh or coming off as a judgmental know it all. 
um, I sometimes have to act surprised when people tell me about the bad consequences of their unbiblical decisions. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, Bob. <laughs> Help me out here. Help me out, Aaron. Dr. John, just shake your head. Thank you. <laughs> Eric. Listen. I, I listen to a lot of stuff from Christians, and they tell me the bad stuff that's happening. I'm like, shocker. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me speak to the beautiful mystery of God's plans. I gotta get off the station. <laughs> let me, I, wanna, I wanna speak to the beautiful mystery of God's plans by giving you two passages of scripture, two quotes, and, and we'll get out of here. So Proverbs 16:9. Proverbs 69 says, the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Proverbs 19.21 says, many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. See, in, in a very mysterious way, um, God is so sovereign that though you and I plan things and some things are ill-advised, uh, some things we just totally miss it on. For those of us that love God and are called according to his purpose, he is able to weave things together into this beautiful tapestry for our good. I don't understand that, but God does that. Two quotes here, one's by Elizabeth Elliot, and she says this. She says, God is God, and if he is God, then there is no place safer than in his will. And his will is always immeasurably, unspeakably, infinitely beyond any of your largest notions about what he's up to. You're not going to figure him out. The reason why you have to lean on him is because you're not going to know everything. And that's okay. Last quote is from Tim Keller. Um, I've heard him talk about this before. I know it's it's something he heard, but I, I couldn't get the source. Um, but this is what he says. He says, if the distance between the earth and the sun, 93 million miles, was no more than the thickness of a sheet of paper, then the distance from the earth to the nearest star would be a stack of paper 70 feet high. You guys following? The diameter of the Milky Way would be a stack of paper over 300 miles high. Keep in mind, that there are more galaxies in the universe than we can number. There are more, it seems, than dust specks in the air or grains of sand on the seashores. Now, if Jesus Christ holds all this together with the word of his power, according to Hebrews 1.3, is he the kind of person you ask into your life to be your assistant? You don't know everything. But if you're a believer, you know a God that does. So trusting in the Lord with all your heart, leaning not on your own understanding, is the best thing we can do. It's the best thing we can do. So we lean on our own understanding through our pride, through our performance and through our plans, but God wants us to lean like Pisa. Amen. He wants us to lean his way. All right, so let's stand together. We're gonna respond in worship, but I just wanna, I wanna make this, this last point. Uh, the last point I wanna make is this. Um, Jesus is the ultimate example of someone who didn't lean on his own understanding. All right, Jesus amassed a perfect record without giving in to pride. He never had to hide or cover his sin through performance, and he completely trusted his father's sovereign plan. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter cuts off the ear of a man trying to seize Jesus, and Jesus tells him, hey, I can have legions of angels come down right now and save me, but how then will the scriptures be fulfilled? As Jesus is carrying his cross, they're gonna hang him on a cross and they have him carrying his cross. There are some women that are uh, behind him that are walking and they're weeping and they're wailing. And Jesus says to them, daughters of Jerusalem, 
do not weep for me, weep for yourselves and your children. He's quoting Hosea 10. And when Jesus was dying on the cross, he was hanging on the cross, dying for you and me. He says two things, he says a few things, but he says two things I wanna call out. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in his last breaths, he says, into your hands, I commit my spirit. That's Psalm 22 and Psalm 31. Which is to say this, in Jesus' most desperate moments, God's word was on his mind and it leaked out of him. He did not lean on his own understanding. He trusted God to the very end. With rebellious fidelity, Jesus trusted the Lord with all his heart. He did not lean on his own understanding and it killed him. Jesus paid the debt of guilt and shame that we owed. Jesus took our shame by being hung in public, numbered with criminals, and he took our guilt by taking our sin on himself and paying the price and dying for us. So as we sing, we're just gonna take a moment and sing a chorus. But as we sing, I just want you to think of the chorus of that worship song. Why is it a war? Ask God that prayerfully. Why is there a war to give you all of me? Yeah. You'll put your full weight on something if you know it'll hold you. Jesus can hold you. Jesus can hold you. Make Jesus your center of gravity. All right? Lean on Jesus and he will make you a marvel to the world. Uh, there's a comedian, uh, Trevor Noah, and he talked about the, the, the Tower of Pisa and he said, leave it to the Italians to take a disaster and turn it into a tourist attraction. Right? Um, but leave it to God to take the disaster that is your life and my life, hallelujah, and turn it into a marvel for his glory, amen. That's what God does. That's what God does, right? And so if in your pride, if in your performance or in your plans, you've been leaning on yourself, but you want to lean your full weight on Jesus, we're running out of time here, but if you're here, you would say, Sean, I know I need Jesus. Just slip your hand up. I just want to pray for you. Amen. Amen. Maybe you've been walking with Jesus for a long time. Like you're, you're, you're used to this. You, you actually knew I was going to do this at the end of the service. You're so used to the, the rhythm of it. But if, but if Holy Spirit is yanking on your heart, this is a moment. Just by raising your hand, it can do something that'll change your life forever. So this is my last call because we have to go. Just raise your hand. If you're here, you say, Sean, I need to, to place my full weight on Jesus. I am tired of walking in pride. I'm, try, I'm tired of trusting in my performance. I'm tired of trying to live it out in my own plan. And I want to give myself fully to the care of Jesus. I want to make him the center of gravity in my life. Just raise your hand. all over the room. So those of you with your hands up, if you just put your hand on your heart, Lord, I just, I present to you, my friends, I thank you. But God, sometimes it takes us just taking a step back and seeing that in our pride, we are so focused on ourselves, we can't focus on you. Sometimes it takes us seeing that in our attempt to be good, in our attempt to do the right things, we're relying on that more than we're relying on your merits and your record. God, it's hard for us to see that we're working out and walking out our plans. But God, would you just give us the ability as your people, as your children, to put our full weight on you, to fully trust you. God, and as we, as we live with a lean, and as we, we live leaning on you, God, would you just use that to show the world how good you are? Would you make us a magnificent landmark for your glory? God, I even sense there's people here who have never named the name of Jesus as their savior. And so I just pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you begin to minister to their hearts.
that you would do a work that only you can do. And as they open their hearts to you, as they say yes, God, that you would help them to see their need to repent, to turn away from sin, and to receive you fully. I thank you, God, that you're doing that now.